Bossy, bossy, bossy. Okay. Welcome everybody online. Uh, welcome if you're here in the sanctuary. We are studying the screw tape letters and we are falling further and further behind, but that's okay. We're, we're, on, we're going to study uh, letter eight today. You are, if you're keeping up, you're supposed to be on like letter 12. So uh, if you've fallen behind, that's okay because we take our time. Remember, we're not studying the letter for the, or the book for the book's sake. We're using the book as an outline to study God's Word, and when you study God's Word, sometimes it takes time, and uh, that revelation that we get from His Word is worth the uh, time we spend. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank You for the folks who are gathered here and the, those who are listening online. I pray that Your Holy Spirit would have free course in the lives of us all, that we might be open in our hearts and our minds to be built up in our faith in You. Lord, there are ups and downs that we all experience. A lot of us are experiencing a time of dryness or a time of down because of all the things that are happening in the world. But we pray that you would shine your light upon us and that you would uh, grant us your spirit and that we might take it home with us and use what you have given us to your glory and to our benefit. In Jesus' name, amen. C.S. Lewis uses a word in uh, this letter that I had not really heard before, perhaps you have and I'm just out of it, but he uses the word undulation, undulation. In this letter, Screwtape is getting annoyed at Wormwood's inexperience and his naive enthusiasm because Wormwood's getting all excited because his patient, the young man that we're following, (coughs) his religious phase his excitement about being a new Christian is fading. It's dying away. Tape tells Wormwood, don't be so excited. The Lord's law of undulation is at play. What does undulation mean? Well, it means it defi- it, the definition itself has to do with waves the rising and the falling of waves. It's a transition from up to down to up to down. If you've ever been seasick, I've been seasick once in my life, and next to food poisoning, it is the worst thing in the world. Undulation is not quite that bad, but it is up and down and back and forth Sometimes, in our context, sometimes you are close to God, and other times you are not close to God. And Wormwood, the junior little devil, is saying, this is great, my guy is, is drying up, he's not close to God. And Screwtape says, no, I've been here before, that's a natural part of what people go through who are Christian people. Go to Matthew, please, in your Bible. Matthew, or no, Mark. Go to Mark chapter 9. This verse has always kind of confounded me and given me a sense of hope for people who are struggling. Mark chapter 9. And we're going to start at the 19th verse. Jesus says, generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Obviously, he's going to heal someone. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsion. He fell to the ground, rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, 
I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. What does he mean by that? He means I believe, but not all the way believe. This would be too fantastic for you to heal my son. I imagine that there's someone in the sanctuary or listening online who has had times of unbelief, undulation. There are all kinds of reasons why a person can go through a time of unbelief. I really don't want to get into it because I don't have the Bible verses with me, but there is a teaching out there that once you are saved, you are always saved. In fact, once you are saved, you don't even sin anymore. You just make mistakes. Well, there are plenty of scriptures that say that where St. Paul in particular is saying, Man, I, just, I don't want to save everybody else and at the end lose my own salvation. And there are perhaps times when you wonder if you really believe the way that you think or act or speak. And that's an undulation. That's an up and a down unbelief. There are dry and dull times. The, the book that best expresses this, and we're not going to go there because I'm trying to make some headway, but if you read the book of Psalms, or the hymn book of the Bible really, Psalms, you will see King David and Moses and all psalm writers, they sometimes are up and they sometimes are down. Praise the Lord, all that's within me, praise his holy name. He has created the world, they'll go on and on and on, how wonderful God is. And then there'll be another psalm. I believe, isn't it? I hope that you understand that when Jesus said, I'll give you a nickel if you can tell me. When Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why was Jesus saying that? Oh, I owe you a nickel. He was quoting Psalm 22. He was not, as you have been taught and think, crying out in despair. Because he wondered what God was doing. How, why would God forsake me now? He wasn't just a, ah, why have you forsaken me? He was quoting Scripture back to the Lord. And when you quote the first verse of a hymn, you are incorporating everything that it, that hymn says within your meditation, within your exclamation to God. Jesus was actually throwing him his, him, his whole self, both the darkness that he was experiencing and the praise that he would experience in that psalm. If you're ever feeling a little angry at God, <coughs> or a little distant from God, you don't want to commit heresy. You don't want to blaspheme God and cuss him out. But you can come close to that without offending God by finding the proper psalm to say back to God, because God's word back to him is never offensive to him. I mean, yes, God accepts you and I as we are, but he does not, <clears throat> uh, he will not tolerate, he will not bless blasphemy or heresy shouted in his direction from his faithful people. He does more so from those who are unfaithful, for those who don't believe. But you can quote the Psalms because the psalmist all experienced undulation. C.S. Lewis threw screw tape in this letter. I don't know if you remember. Do you remember? He calls us amphibians. Calls us a hybrid. When you're driving a hybrid, you're driving... Some, I don't know. I'm, I don't know what you're driving. Half gas, half corn? Half electric? Half gas, half electric. 
What he's saying, that calling us amphibians, is that we are animals, just like the other animals, with a spirit. Now, uh, how dare I say that C.S. Lewis is wrong? But that's a very Greek or Platonic way of looking at you and me, as though we are just animals, like any other animal, with a spirit. Remember, all of the other animals were created by God through His Word. We, his people, the crown of his creation, were created with his spirit and were formed from the dust of the ground. We were told to have dominion over all of the other animals. We are, in the book of Genesis, over and over again, as I know I've said before, we are male and female, he created us. And what's wrong with our culture exclaiming the heresy and the blasphemy that we are not male or female, we are some hybrid, is blasphemy against God because that's the essence of creation. It's, it's how he made us. And he made you who you are for a distinct purpose and reason. We are not just half-spirit and half animal. We are all spirit and all flesh. And one is tied into the other. I've had pneumonia for about a month now, apparently, and I'm telling you, it is hard to be spiritual when you're not feeling well. I'm not feeling well in my body, so it's hard for me to feel well in my spirit. What death is, is an unnatural separation from, of your body and your spirit. It is not what God ever intended. And when in our creeds we say we believe in the resurrection of the body, life everlasting, that is our final hope. And I'll give you a little hint. I almost don't like saying it, but I've studied the scriptures carefully. And most of the scriptures that we refer to when our loved ones pass, saying, uh, you know, the joy of, of being reunited with all of our loved ones, it's there, but most of the scriptures are referring to when our bodies and our spirit are reunited as God wanted them to be at the end time, the last day. The body, the scriptures say in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And he says, you better take care of your body and don't mix it up with prostitutes and do bad things because your body is where the Holy Spirit is. And I've been with many, many people who have passed away in my career, in my calling, been at their bedside when they passed. And you can almost feel the Spirit leave the body and as soon as the spirit leaves the body, the body ceases to be a body, in a sense. It becomes material. It immediately becomes organized dust, in a way. If you've ever seen it, it's just, it happens so quickly. But... Even though St. Paul says that our bodies are just a tent holding, uh, a temporary tent in this world, holding who we really are, within that verse, I believe it's in 2 Corinthians, he, he is also explaining that we are, we are destined for a permanent home. And that permanent home, he's not talking about a location, he's talking about that our spirit will be with our uh, glorified body. These bodies are decaying. This is a tent. This doesn't last. But when you die and you are with God in heaven, today you will be with me in paradise, when you are with your loved ones, you will probably not experience time, but will in your 
experience, not ours, but in your experience, you will experience the last day and the judgment and your body and your, uh, your body and your spirit will be in a permanent glorified body which will not decay and will not get pneumonia or have anything else happen to it. So C.S. Lewis through screw tape is teaching false doctrine here. What he is saying is though his point is this. We, uh, we have the Spirit within us, we are God's children, and we are created in His image, but Screwtape is telling Wormwood, you can't say to a person who's experiencing undulation that I'm going to work on one or the other of those things. I'm going to go refer to the letter. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, it is definitely through his voice. Now, you can argue as to whether or not Lewis is using his voice to say what Lewis thinks about the dichotomy of flesh and spirit, or is he lying? Like, is screw tape lying? Uh, and he doesn't agree with him. And I remember at the introduction, now that you say that, that one of the things Lewis told us to be careful of is that sometimes screw tape will say something and he's lying when he's saying it. I'm not sure here why he would be lying to Wormwood about this, but uh, good point, and I'll take it. Uh, very much so. All right. Uh, the Lord says, the Lord says, Screwtape says to Wormwood, now it may surprise you to learn that in his, God's, efforts to get permanent possession of a soul, he relies on the troughs even more than on the peaks. Some of his special favorites have gone through longer and deeper troughs than anyone else. The reason is this, listen to this, to us, to the devil, a human is primarily food. Our aim is the absorption of its will into ours, the increase of our own area of selfhood at its expense. But obedience which the enemy demands of men is quite a different thing. His service and obedience brings perfect freedom. Okay, God uses negative undulation, the valleys, the troughs, as he calls them, more than the peaks to help us grow in our faith. You've heard this before, but you don't want it any more than I do. We don't rejoice. Well, actually, the Bible, even to quote the Bible, says rejoice in your sufferings. But we don't rejoice because of our sufferings. We can rejoice within our sufferings because we know that God loves us. We know that we are forgiven. We know we're going to heaven. And so the sufferings that we are experiencing are a test, not a temptation. It builds character. It builds perseverance. It builds hope. And Wormwood is, is being told that don't necessarily cheer when a Christian is going through a tough time. Because going through a tough time is when Christians become more Christian, not less. It's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God than a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Why? Because he's got so much. Uh, this is where I always tease myself and tease you as well. Because we know that it's harder to go to heaven when we are doing well than when we are not doing well, when we have too much of everything. And too much of everything distracts us from the things we need to be doing. How many of you, if you won the lottery this week, would say, no, I don't want that? Very few of us would do that. I don't want that to keep me away from God, keep me out of heaven. I'm going to rip this up. 
The devil does not like us necessarily to be suffering because he sees that suffering opens up our heart to another world. One of the reasons Christianity is growing like wildfire in South America and in Africa is because they are being, the gospel is being shared with them and they don't have anything else. And because death is right at their doorstep all the time where we don't really experience, we're experiencing more death now than ever perhaps, but it's still we're isolated from it. Okay, um, there are Bible verses that confirm this in James and in Romans, what I'm talking about, and you can th- look at your own life and say, when is it, when do I feel closer to God, or when do I appeal more to God? When my life is busy and full? Perhaps you do. Or when my life is, is in need? Bo. Bo says you learn more by losing than winning. I have golfed with Bo, (laughs) and he's got plenty of experience in uh, in growing that way. Yeah, that's a good point. Screwtape says he really, he being Christ, really does want to fill the universe with a lot of loathsome little replicants, replicas of himself. Creatures whose life on its minuscule scale will be qualitatively like his own. Not because he has absorbed them, but because their wills freely conform to him. And he says these words. This is screw tape. We want cattle who can finally become food. He wants servants who can finally become sons. The devil wants cattle who can finally become food. Jesus wants servants who can finally become sons, children. Go to Ephesians, please, chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 22. Chapter 4, verse 22 of Ephesians. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God replicas, little replicas of Jesus, to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And look at verse 24, to put on the new self. This is incredibly important. It does not come from inside of you. It come, you put on the righteousness. The, the fancy word is vicarious righteousness. You cover yourself with Christ. You pretend to be Christ, like an athlete would pretend to be. My boys all pretended all their lives to be Larry Bird, because we were growing up in Boston. And their pretending to be like Larry Bird helped them to make shots, helped them to be a better basketball player. They weren't Larry Bird, but they were better basketball players. If you have to fake it to be like Jesus, to be a replica of Jesus, even though you're not feeling it or you yourself are incapable of it, that's okay. Because God sees you having covered yourself, put on Christ. You see, all through the New Testament in particular, it talks about being born again. It talks about being a new creation. It talks about crucifying yourself so that you no longer live but Christ lives in you. See, all of these things, 
be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind in view of, of the mercy of God. You're trying to change your behavior through a matter of your wanting to. And you always disappoint yourself because you don't make it. What the New Testament is saying is that it, the change is more radical than that. We no longer do what we want to do. We do what Christ would do. And that's not because of our own motivation to do it. It's because when we hear God's Word, study God's Word, and live God's Word, He becomes, He lives through us. And we do far more than we could ever imagine or think, as the Scriptures say. God wants to fill the universe with little replicas of Himself who voluntarily choose to love and to serve Him. Obedience to Satan is slavery. Obedience to God is freedom. When you drive a car and you put, and the car is in good shape and you look at the instructions and you change the oil and you do all, then that car brings you freedom. When you neglect the car and don't take care of it, you get, you see it all over Memphis. You get broken down. That's not freedom. Honor the Father out of love and respect rather than be being driven by fear and hatred of the devil. Both obedience from different and opposite perspectives are expressed. Go to the Gospel of John, please, the Gospel of John. And I'm not going to leave this cattle idea. I want to talk about that for a minute. John chapter 14 and verse 15, you're probably not going to get there before I say it, so don't worry about it. <coughs> Jesus says, and again, what I'm saying is obedience to, save, to Satan is slavery because he will take, 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 make you dependent on him and take and take and take some more. He'll give you 20 bucks, and when you need that 20 bucks the most, he'll steal it back again. Obedience to God is freedom. 14 John verse 15. If you love me, you will obey what I command. That's how you prove that you love Jesus. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be what? In you. And will be in you. Excuse me. So, it's okay to come to church because you're, you fear that if you don't come to church, you're going to go to hell. It's okay. But it really doesn't, really doesn't bless God very much. I mean, you're being obedient, but you're being obedient out of fear. As though God is some kind of a uh, mean master who's going to whip you and beat you if you don't do what he says. If you go to church because you honor and love God, and you know you are so thankful for what he has done, and you want to praise and thank him and receive the nurture that he says he has for you, that blesses God. And so I think probably, knowing people the way I do, I think there's probably a little bit of both of, their, of those things when we go to church especially when we're enduring one of my sermons perhaps and it's gone 20 minutes and you're going, man, I sure hope I get some benefit out of this. I sure hope I get some points. Contrast life of cattle versus sons on a ranch. What do cattle know? Cattle get fed we just came back from Missouri a little bit ago, and there's lots of cattle out there. And you see them, and they're hanging out together, chewing on something, walking around. They're not thinking, wow, I'm going to be a hamburger someday. They're just thinking, 
there's another piece of grass over there. I'm going to go get that. Um, another piece of grass over there. I sure hope the farmer brings some hay. I don't know what the cattle think, but they don't know what's ahead of them. Steak. Burgers. Cattle. Do you know how many unbelievers there are in the world who are basically cattle? They're smart cattle. They're intellectual cattle. But they're cattle. They don't know. They don't know that they're basically hamburger. Food for Satan. Dennis. Yeah, that's what I mean. They don't know. I mean, a cattle doesn't know. A, a cow or a, a what, do you call, what do you call a boy? A steer doesn't know. It's a steer, and and it's heading for the factory. It doesn't know. And yeah, it's not like people are walking around going, "Oh man, I know I'm going to hell. I know I'm I'm not going to heaven. I'm that's where I'm living." They're, they don't believe it. They don't even think it. Satan sees us as food. You are, the Bible tells you over and over again, it contrasts not so much cattle and sons, but it contrasts slaves and sons. Where slaves don't have any ownership, sons have, or have an inheritance. So, he goes on to say, so I get, I'm getting mixed up now, Doc, in terms of who's saying what, whether it's Lewis or whether it's Screwtape. Screwtape goes on to say that by nature, God will not use the weapons of the irresistible and the indisputable to win his people. Do you know what that means? He will not force us to obey him and to love him. It would be useless. We are not puppets. The Garden of Eden, I remember I asked Dr. Scare in seminary once, and I said, I thought I was being really smart, and I said, if God knew that they were going to eat of the forbidden fruit, and why put, why put it there? I had a kid at the time. I said, I don't put a knife on the table if I know my kid's going to pick it up and play with it if I leave it there. And Dr. Scare basically looked at me and he said, Nujabauer, nobody wants to hear from you. That was his answer. I've grown up from that time a little bit and I realized, it, tell me in a word Tell me in a couple of words. Don't go into a big explanation. What was the tree in the garden? I'll give you another nickel if you tell me. What was the tree in the garden? No, the tree of life was a different tree. That tree had to be protected because that was the tree from the book of Revelation, Genesis to Revelation, where you would live eternally. And God didn't want us to live eternally under sin. So he guarded that tree. What is that tree in the garden? Pardon me? Yeah, it is definition, but yes, this definition is a, tr is a tree, the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I got that, but what was it really? Ooh, you're getting close. It's another C word. See, free will does not start with C. It was their church. It was their church. It was their offering. It was them denying themselves in obedience to God who loved them. It was showing God, we worship you. Because you told us not to do that and you give us everything else. And you're not going to force us. You've given us free will. And so the tree is, is the, it's the first church. Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, you heard it now. And I just, isn't that something? Don't you think I'm right? 
It is, it is the way, the reason that it was there was because if it wasn't there, they would have been robots. There's no relationship. If your husband or your wife says, um, well, I've got to be careful here. <laughs> says, take out the trash or, I'm going to get silly here, take out the trash or you're not getting dinner. That's so 1950s, I'm sorry. You may take out the trash, but you're taking out the trash because you're afraid of, if you don't, you're not going to get dinner. But if you see the trash and you say, I love my wife, I'm going to take the trash out, then that's a whole different way of doing it. <coughs> the tree in the garden was what the devil hates, is God will not use the weapons of irresistible and indisputable to win us. In other words, He's not going to force you to love Him. He's not going to force you to do what He wants to do, wants you to do. He loves you too much for that, and the only, God is love, and love always demands an object. And he created you and I to have a loving relationship with each other and a loving relationship with him. What does the law and gospel have to do with this? Well, he does not use the indisputable and the irresistible like in a magic way to make you like, I obey you, God. I cannot do otherwise than to obey you. But he does move us by the law, move us to our knees where the law condemns us all. All have short, sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, not one. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. So he lovingly gives you the law to bring you to your knees and then he lovingly gives you the gospel to help you stand up and to love him and to honor him the way that he wants to be loved and honored. And again, I've said this a thousand times, but in our society, we think we're owed everything. Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody should, everybody should be equal and all this sort of thing. During the time of Scripture and throughout history up until lately, historically speaking, people couldn't believe that God would deign to save anyone. We say he should save everybody just because we are. In the olden days, they were like, wow, really? God would do that? That's amazing. He is a loving and caring and compassionate God. He wants somebody like me to be in relationship to him in his kingdom forever? That's amazing. Not I'm going to have some questions for God when I get there, which I've actually had people say to me. So, moving on. The, it is the, it, this is still letter number eight, having to do with undulation. The will of people is what the devil seeks to destroy and God strengthens to sustain us through the bad times. Your will is greater than your emotions or even your reason. It keeps going even when it seems useless to do so. I'm going to read an awesome quote. And I know many of you have a will like this. Listen to this. Do not be deceived, Wormwood. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring, but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks round about the universe, looks round upon a universe from which every trace of him, God, seems to have vanished, and asks why he has been forsaken, and still obeys. That is your will. 
Your will is not based on circumstances. Your will is not based on your emotions or how you feel about God. Your will is based on God's promise that will not be shaken. When I was in boot camp, um, when there was 90 of us in a barracks, and when our CB came in who was there to torment us, somebody would always, the first person to see him had to say, attention on deck. And then we all snapped to attention. It became a reflex. It became something that wasn't thought of. It became something that you did. Well, there was one time we didn't always sleep on our beds during the day if we had any time. We slept under our beds because you didn't want to mess up the, uh, the folding that you did and you spend so much time on. And so there was one time a bunch of guys, not me, but a bunch of guys were sleeping under their bed and the guy showed up and, attention on deck! And boom! They all smacked their heads on the, on the frame of the bed and, were, and they crawled out from under and there's all these guys standing like this with blood running down their head because they had... It had become so a part of them. You know, me- muscle memory kind of thing. Well, that's the kind of will that people have who have been through the troughs, the valleys, and they've seen God there. And they've been to the peaks and the mountaintops, and they've seen God there. And they recognize that they themselves are hopeless, but that in God and Christ, all hope is theirs. Yes, the, that is very good. The book of Job. Explain a little bit more. Very good. His will was strong. Very good. Yes. His will would not let him curse God and die like his wife told him to do. Uh, He, very good. Job was pretty complaining about things. Uh, But no, that's very true. He never gave up. His friends kept telling him, yeah, come on, you had to have done something wrong. God doesn't love you anymore, blah, blah, blah. And he kept saying, no, that is not true. Yeah, he, he knew about resurrection. He knew what was happening. All right, anything else with letter number eight? A lot of things to think about. Think about, again, undulation. If you go through a dry period, don't be afraid that you are losing your faith. And don't stay away from the church when you feel guilty or when you feel like you're going through a dry period, that's ridiculous. That's like saying, I'm really thirsty, so I'm not going to go to the fountain. Or I'm not going to go to, I'm feeling really guilty about my sins, I'm not going to go to Holy Communion. I've still got a little touch of pneumonia, I'm going back to the doctor because it's not going away. I'm not going to stay away from the doctor because I don't want him to tell me what's, that I've still got pneumonia. I've got to go. And I know, I know women in particular, several, who will not go to the doctor because they're afraid the doctor's going to tell them something bad. I know we men get a bad rap. He doesn't go to the doctor. He doesn't take care of himself, blah, blah, blah. But I know lots of women who will not go because they don't want to be told something negative. Sometimes you have to be told negative to be healed. That's law and gospel again. So, uh, there you go. Now, the next letter is letter number nine. It has to do with pleasures during down times. I'm not really going to get into it today because uh, it gets into a whole other subject, but um, I appreciate you being with me, and I look forward to getting better and uh, continuing on our study. So, keep going but also review so that you know what what we're doing. Next time will be letter number nine.
and hopefully letter number 10 as well. Okay, thank you.